Are we all wet? Yeah! Exactly. And here's a marvelous convenient place for us. This ring pot shall be our stage. That popcorn break, our tiring house. And we will do it in action as we would do it before the Duke. Gentles, perchance you wonder at this stage. But wonder on to truth is all things plain. Get your apparel together. Who streams to your beards? Who ribbons to your pumps and And every man look over his part, and most dear actors, eat no onions nor garlic, for we are under sweet bread. No more words. Away! Go away! William Shakespeare, the greatest English poet, was born in a tiny market town of Stratford in Avon in 1564. He traditionally celebrated his birthday on April 23rd. Although we have no written record of this fact, we do know that Shakespeare was christened at the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford on April 26th. At the time, it was the custom to baptize babies three days after birth. Interestingly enough, it was also the fact that 52 years later exactly, Shakespeare died in Stratford on April 23rd and is buried under the same floor of the Holy Trinity Church where he was christened. Get on with it, will you? Don't interrupt if you would please. Your turn will come. Shakespeare studied the Greek and Roman playwrights in the school grammar school at Stratford. He borrowed his five act format from the Roman Plazos, who in turn borrowed from the Greeks, especially Sophocles. Often a prologue was introduced before the action to help acquaint the audience with both characters and plot. Aha! I knew he'd get to me. It's not fair, I was here first! True, but the prologue always goes first. That is true, except for in Shakespeare's case. He wrote the logs for less than one third of his place. He preferred to let the actors tell the story for themselves. Give me strength! And the university wits, like Robert Greene, called Shakespeare an upstart crow and said he was uncool. Of course, not too many people have heard of Robert Greene's plays these days. However, Shakespeare did write some beautiful prologues. And so, patient audience, and the impatient actors! We will begin our action with excerpts of the prologues of the plays Pericles, Henry V, and Henry VIII. I shower a welcome on you. Welcome all. Your presence glads our days. Honor we love. For who hates honor hates the gods above. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Pardon, gentles all, your the flat, unraved, unraved spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth such an object. Can this coffin hold the vasty fields of Rome? Or may we cram within this window the very tumult that did fill the air of longs? <coughs> Let us, on your imaginary force of work, paint out our imperfections with your thoughts. Think, when we talk of horses, that you see them, 
printing their proud hopes in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that must now deck our world, carry them here and there, jumping over time, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. Prepare for mirth, for mirth becomes a feast. You are princes and my guests. Your gentle, your humble patience we pray gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. All the world's a stage! No, 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 not yet. First, we have something very special for you. We'd like to present to you one of Shakespeare's most memorable songs and two monologues. First for Romeo and Juliet, and another for King Knox. So please, enjoy. Those lips that love them hands to wait breathe forth the sound that said, I hate to me that languished for her sake. But when she saw my woeful mistake, straight in her heart did mercy come, chiding that tongue that ever sweet was used in giving such gentle doom. And taught me thus a new degree. I hate. She altered with an end, as gentle day doth follow night, who like a fiend from heaven to hell is flown away. I hate and hate away she threw, and saved my life, saying not you. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, he but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to man. Always some other name. What's in the name? That which we call a rose, by any other name would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo Paul, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo doth thy name, and for that name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. I will not back. I am too high-born to be property, to be a secondary at control, a useful serving man, an instrument to any sovereign state throughout the world. First kindle the dead poor wars between this chastised kingdom and myself. To drive now that should feed this fire, and now tis far too huge. To be blown out that same weak wind which you deal with it. You taught me how to know the face of right, acquainted me of interest to this gnat. Okay, thrust this enterprise into my heart, and now you tell me John hath made his peace with Rome. What is that peace to you? I, by the honor of my marriage bed, after young Arthur, claim this man for mine. Now it is half come. Must I back because that John hath made his peace of Rome? Am I Rome's slave? What penny hath Rome borne? What men provided? What munition sent to the proper fashion? 
It's not I that undergo this charge, who is but I? It's such as my claim or liable, sweating this business to maintain this war. Have I not heard these islanders shout out, flee by the wise as I fight to their towns? Have I not heard the best cards of the game win this easy match, playing for a crown? And shall I now give over the human set? No. No. On my soul, it never shall be said. And all the men and women merely players. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player who struts and frets an hour upon stage, and then is heard no more. And for the cruel act of now, I've forgotten my paw. And I am now even so told the truth. All the world's a stage. <laughs> and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts being seven inches. At first, the infant, mewing and puking in the nurse's arms. <laughs> then the whining schoolboy, with satchel and shining morning face, <coughs> creeping like a snake, unwillingly to school. <laughs> Sighing like a furnace, with woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. <laughs> then the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like a jealous in honor. Sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and then the justice, in fair round belly, with eyes near and near formal cuts, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth stage shifts to the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful pose sing, a world too wide for his shrunk shape, and his big manly voice, turning again towards childish trebles, pipes and whistles in his sound. <laughs> <laughs> the last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste. Oh. <laughs> That was the famous Seven Ages of Man speech as in London. <laughs> I've been delighted for the few interruptions from Macbeth and Court of Kings. Did you know that Shakespeare made his fortune not from the plays that he never published, but being part owner and manager of the Old Club Theater? The Old Club can hold over 2,500 playgoers, and they were a noisy bunch. Yeah! Yeah! 
Not like the kind of curious folk we have in our audiences today. The most important part of Elizabeth audiences were the ground so called so because they were the cheapest admissions and therefore had to stand in the pit surrounding the stage. The groundlings disapproved of the action of the play. They would often make rude noises and throw rotten vegetables. One might even get up on stage and punch the offending actor in the nose. Don't even think about it. Shakespeare knew his audience as well, especially the groundlings. Probably like because he's most likely one himself as a small boy in Stratford. He, he often wrote in scenes to help appease the crowds. Once, a good example of this is a scene from Macbeth, direct, following directly after the spine tinglingly and intensely dramatic murder of King Duncan. Shakespeare inserts a comic relief to help appease his audience's heightened emotions and present some of the hidden groundings could relate. A working man, uneducated, Freezing cold and more than a little tipsy. So sit, good around this, and enjoy the drunken porter scene from Macbeth. Here's a knocking indeed. If a man were a porter of Hellgate, he would have much turning of the key. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there in the name of the other one? Ah, here's a farmer that hangs himself on the expectation of good crops, but yet low prices. Come in, here you'll sweat for it. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there in the other devil's name? Faith, here's a judge that could swear in both scales against himself. He could not. Judge his way to heaven. Come in, oh judge. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Faith! There's an English tailor that comes here by stealing from his customers. Come in, oh tailor. Here you can roast your goods. Knock, knock. Never a quiet. Who are you? This place is too cold for hell. I'll play the devil's border no longer. I thought it to let in all the professions that go down the criminal path to the everlasting bonfire. Anon, anon! I pray you remember the border. Oh, was it so late, friend? Or are you went to bed? Yeah, you do like so late. Faith, sir, we were carousing to the second cock and the train, sir, is a provoker of three things. What three things does make expression for that? Mary, sir, red noses, sleep, and urine. I believe you gave me my last night. That is just uh, the very throat of me. Couple of something, make it a word and a glow. You shall find me apt enough to that, sir. Will you give me a occasion? Can I take some kids without giving? Mercutio, thou consortus with Romeo. Consortus? What? Does not make us minstrels? Does not make minstrels of us? Look to hear nothing but discord. Here's my fiddle stick. Here's something to make you dance. Down, consort. We talk here in the pot upon a man, either withdraw in some private place, reason coldly of your dreaming. Or else depart, you all eyes gaze on us. Let the eyes are made to look, and let them gaze. I'm not watching them at pleasure. I will peace be with you, sir. Here comes my man. Now we hang, sir, if you wear your livery. Romeo, the love I bear thee, can afford no better term than this. Thou art a villain. Sibyl, the reason that I have to love thee is that thou must excuse the appertaining rage of such a dream. Villain, I am done. Therefore, farewell. I see thou knowest me not. Boy, that shall not excuse the injuries that thou hast done me. Therefore, turn and draw. I do protest that I never injured thee, but love thee better than thou canst devise. 
So thou shalt know the reason of my love, and so this happy that which may my tender as dearly as my heart be satisfied. O oh, call of dishonorable vile submission! Tumult! You rap at her, we walk! What wouldst thou have with me? Good king of cats, nothing more than thy lives that I need to make bold with all. I am for you. Gentle Mercutio, put thy rape here. Come, turn your side off. Draw up and walk up and down the way. Gentle with the chance to serve the salary. Tumult, Mercutio, the place you presently have. Forbid this man in the street. Hold to the good Mercutio. Away, 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 away! I hurt a plague of both your houses. I'm sped. Has he gone and had nothing? What, are thou hurt? I, I, a scratch. Great is enough. Courage, man, the hurt cannot be much. No, tis not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church door. But tis enough. Twill serve. As for me tomorrow, I shall find me a brave man. A plague of both your houses. Zounds! A dog, a rat, a mouse, a cat, to scotch a man to death. While the devil will be between us, I will turn on your arm. I thought over the best. Tell me to some house been loyal, or I shall faint. A plague of both your houses! Your house is! <laughs> Mercutio, my very friend, the prince is near out, like, hath got this mortal hurt in my eye. My reputation stayed with Tybalt's slander. That Tybalt, that hour hath been my cousin. O oh, sweet Juliet, thy beauty is mainly effeminate, and in my temper softened by your steel. Romeo, Romeo, pray Mercutio's dead. That gallant spirit that inspired the clouds which shall hardly scorn the earth. This begins the Black fate on no days doth depend. This begins the woe, others must end. The furious symbol, back again. Again, in trying to Mercutio's slain, is but a little way above our heads. Either thou or I, or both, must go with him. <laughs> Romeo, Romeo, away, be gone. The citizens are up, and Sybil slain. Stand on maze the prince will do thee death. If thou art taken hence, away be gone. Oh, I'm fortune's fool. Why does thou stay? <laughs> How many ages can shall this? Our lofty scene be acted over, in states unborn, and accents yet unknown. Antonius! Sleeper? <laughs> <laughs> How do you have men about me that are fat? Sleep-headed men, as such as sleep at night. Don Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear not, Caesar, he is not dangerous. He is a noble lover and well given. I would be that you were fat. I do not know a man that I should avoid so soon as that spirit Cassius. He reads much. He loves no plays, as our boss teaches him, and hears no music. He is a great observer and loves quiet through the deeds of men. Seldom he smiles, and he smiles in such a way as if he mocked that a spirit can be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he are never at heart's ease when they behold greater than themselves, and therefore are very dangerous. <laughs> Speak, hands, for me! Two, through ten, my fault, these are liberty, freedom, cheering is dead, run hence proclaim, cry it about the streets. People, senators, be not afraid. Why not? Stand still. Ambition's debt is paid. Elizabeth and audience, she enjoyed the bloody scenes and tales of horror like the one you just witnessed. Shakespeare loved a lot of them in this place. And now, dear audience, we want to show one of Shakespeare's most memorable speeches, Mark Anthony's funeral oration. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. 
come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do is after them. Good is often in service of love. Let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus have told you that Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and previously have Caesar answered for it. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus said he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. Yeah. Yeah. He brought many captives home to Rome. His ransoms did the general coffers mill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? No! When the poor cried, Caesar had wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yeah! That yeah. Brutus said he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. Yeah! yeah. Thrice I presented a king of the crown, which he did thrice refused. Was this ambition? No! That Brutus said he was ambitious, and sure, Brutus is an honorable man. Walt well, did love him once, not with that cause. Because of what you then to mourn for him. Oh, judge and thou art a brutish beast, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there of Caesar. I must pause so I come back to you. Be patient, Mr. Reason, and the same. Oh, as you have Oh, masters are supposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage. You British wrong and Cassius wrong. You all know our honorable men. I will not do them wrong. But I found this parchment with the seal of Caesar. It is found in his closet. Tis as well. Let but the citizens of Rome hear this testament, which pardon me, I do not mean to read. They are going kiss dead Caesar's wounds. Read the will, read the will. The will! 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 Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not right for you to know how Caesar hath loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. Being men, hearing the will of Caesar will inflame you, will make you mad. Read the will, read it. Mark Antony, you the will. The will. <coughs> will you be patient? Will you stand on? Shall I ascend? Will you give me leave? Come down! Come down! Come down! He said it! 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 He said You will compel me to read the will? Read it! Will! Read the will! Read the will! Baptist, prepare to shut them down! You all do know this mantle. Look, in this place where Cassius staggered through, through this the well beloved Brutus stabbed. As he plucked his curse to steal away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it. For Brutus, you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. Oh, thank you, Oh, noble Caesar, oh, 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 Stay, countrymen. See. Burn. Fire. Kill. Slay. Let not a traitor live. Be civil. Stay, countrymen. Good friends, sweet friends, do not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. They are wise and honorable, and will no doubt answer you with reasons. Away then! Here you speak. Burn as a pretty eye. My friends, you go to do you know not what. You have forgot the will I have told you of. The will! The will! The will! The will! Here's the will under Caesar's seal. Every Roman citizen he gives to every several man seventy-five drachmas. Yes. Yeah. 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 Most noble Caesar, oh royal Caesar. Hear me with patience. These hoes. 
Moreover, he hath left you all his flocks, private orders, and newly planted orchards. He hath left on this side of the tower. He hath left them to you and your heirs forever. Here was the Caesar. When come another? Never. 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 Way, away. We're in his house with a holy grave. Take up the brand. Dirt. We're part of the Jared's houses. There we go. Away then. Now let it work. Mission thou art upon foot. Take what course thou wilt. Dog, just company, and devices, no. In the meantime, 
I will draw no properties, such as our clay ones. Pray. Pray will not. We will meet. And there, we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. <coughs> Take names. Be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's hope, we meet. Enough. Hold or cut bow strings. In Shakespeare's day, there was no director like we come to know in today's theater. One of the members of the acting company would take on the often nerve wracking job of theater manager and help direct his fellow actors through their exits, entrances, and cues. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. The struggles are almost impossible laws, not to mention a ham actor like Autumn in his attempt to present the most fearless and thisbe as seen in A Midsummer Night's Dream. What sayest thou, holy father? There are things in the comedy of Pyrrhus and Disney that will never please. Firstly, Pyrrhus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? Final lady, a perilous fear. I believe we must leave the killing now and well done. Not a wit. I have advice to make all well. I be a prologue. Let this prologue seem to say we will do our own stories. That Pyramus is not killed in thee, that for better assurance, from the eye, Pyramus, I'm not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. We will have such a prologue. And it shall be written in lines of Aiden's Excel. No, make it two more. They were written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afraid of the line? I fear it. I promise you. Master, have to consider with yourselves. To bring God shield us. A lion on a lady is the most dreadful thing. But it's not more fearful wildfowl than your line living. And we have to look to it. Therefore, under the prologue, you must tell me as another lion. Nay, you must name his name, and have his face as you feed the lion's neck. And you must speak through saying thus, please, or fairly, I would wish you, or I would entreat you, not to tremble, not to fear, my life for yours. Do you think I compare those a lion for a pity of my life? No, I am no such thing. I'm a man as other men are. And there, let him name his name, and tell him simply, he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so. But, there's two more things. That is, bring Moon Knight into a chamber. For you know, here Mr. Disney be that difference. Shine that night before I play. A calendar. A calendar. Look at the number that. Find out who shine. Find out who shine. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does shine that night. Why? The members of the basement of the great camera window will be playing open. And the moon may shine in at that casement. Aye. Or else a man should come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and say he doth come to betray the person of moonshine. <laughs> but there's another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber. For appearance of Disney, says the story, did talk me a shape in the wall.
You can never bring it all. What say you, Father? Some men or other must present law. Let us some pressure back and signify law. And have him hold his fingers thus. And through that cranny shall hear us and bid you whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down, every mother to son, and rehearse your parts. Harris, you begin. <coughs> Once you've spoken your speech, enter into that break. Now everyone point to his cue. What tempting home tongues have we swaggering here? So near the cradle of the fairy queen? What? A play in rehearsal? I'll be an audience. An actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. This is me, Sam Ford. This is the flowers of Owen is so sweet. Odorous! 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 Odor, savor, sweet, thine sweetest is we dear. But hark, my voice, say that with the other while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger period is an exploit here. Must I speak now? Aye, Mary must you. For we must understand, he goes with the same voice he has heard, and it's come back again. Most radiant parents, most lily white of you, as true as true as false, and yet with their time, I will make me hear this at Minnie's tomb. Why this is true, man? Why? You must not speak that part yet. Now you answer the pyramids, you speak all your parts at once. Cues and all. Pyramus, enter. The cue is past. It is never tired. As true as true as false, the kid would never tire. If I were fair, I were only thine. <laughs> oh monstrous! Oh strange! We are haunted! Pray masters! Play masters! Help! Not all managers were as befuddled as Peter points, and in Hamlet, Shakespeare's most psychological strategy, the playwright introduces a company of young actors to help further the plot by forcing the evil king of Denmark to realize that Hamlet knows how his father was murdered and why. All the world's a stage! Come on now, that's over and done with. Almost to the end. Thank heavens! In Hamlet's speech to the players, we're given the best advice for acting Shakespeare from the first we should know, Shakespeare himself. Of the king. My honored lord, my most dear lord, my excellent good friends, how dost thou go and stir up? Frozen friends, good lads, how do ye both? As the indifferent children of the world. Happy thou we're not over happy. My lord, we met our, with a company of actors on our way hither, and they are coming to offer you service. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, the adventurous knight will use the short and shield. The lover shall not sigh in vain. The humorous man 
will speak his part without interruption, and the clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are easily tickled, and the lady who said I'm on freedom. What slaves are they? They are, sir. The same you used to take such delight in the tragedians of the city. A brood of young children, little unfledged hawks. What are they, children? How are they supported? Who maintains them? Do they do well? Do the boys carry them away? Aye, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his low tooth, the very globe itself. Get in the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Hark you, Gillenstone, and you too, and each ear I hear. I prophesy he comes to tell me of the players. Mark it. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. Buzz! Buzz! <laughs> the best actors in the world, either for comedy, tragedy, historical, pastoral, pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, historical, pastoral, comical, seen invisible, and comical. Welcome, masters. Welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, my old friend? Why thou hast begun a beard since I saw thee last? Comest thou to beard me in Denmark? <laughs> 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 what, my young lady and mistress? Why thou hast begun a beard since I saw thee last? <laughs> my old lady, your ladyship, has gone every day to heaven when I saw you last by the altitude of your shoes. Pray your boys, be like a piece of uncurring gold, not cracked in the rain. Masters, you are all welcome. Good, my lord, will you see the players while we stare? Do you hear? Let them be well used, for they are the brief and abstract chronicles of the time. After your death, you would be better off to have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. Come, sir. Fall in, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. Dost <laughs> thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzaga? I am, Lord. And you could, if you have need, study a speech of some dozen to sixteen lines I could set down and insert into it, could you not? I am, my Lord. Very well. Follow that, Lord, and look you mock him not. My good friends, I'll meet you till tomorrow night. You are welcome to welcome. Good, my lord. May God be with Constructs over the soul that presently they proclaim their malfactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organs. Have the players play something, like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll probe his looks, I'll observe him to the quick, and if he but flinch, I know my course. The spirit I've seen may be a devil. And the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yeah, and perhaps he abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. Okay. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounce it to you, tripping me on the tongue. But if you have it, like many of our players do, I'd rather the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not sell the air with your hands thus, but use all gently. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustuous, peripated fellow Tear passage to rags, to very tatters, to split the ears of a groundling, which for the most part are incapable of nothing but dark shows and noise. I have a fellow wit for overdoing it, 
Pray you avoid it. I won't, Your Honor. Be not too tame, neither. Follow your own discretion, be your tutor. Speak the action to the word, and the word to the action. All the been players I have seen play, and heard others praise, that have started and bellowed, that I have thought nature's journeymen, have made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. I hope we reform that and never that, sir. Oh, reform it all together, and let those who play our clowns speak no more than is set down for them. Go, players, make thee ready. The play is the thing. Where it all catch the conscience of the king. And so, good audience, we come to the end of this podcast. But before we get the hints, there's one bit of business left. The epilogue. The epilogue tied up the play in a nice little package, so we tie up ours with a sample of the epilogue. The play is The Tempest and A Midsummer Night Fury. Thank you.